Well, I'm happy to have the occasion to visit you today, to offer the Holy Mass for you. Travels for me seem to pick up in the summer months. For the Mick Fathers, they seem to be traveling intensely all year long. Summer travel, though, in particular, presents its own challenges. If I gave the matter some thought, I think I could explain about how all five senses are assaulted anymore when you get on an airplane. But I'm thinking that summer air travel in particular carries with it, well, the challenge of the smell. The air conditioner, they run it just enough, barely, on planes or in airports, but not enough to cool down even the bare bodies you're jammed next to in some very crowded little row of airplane seats. And certainly not enough for the clergy, all swathed as we are in black and with the clerical collar. Traveling in the summer means long delays and a lot of sweating. But what I notice is the stench. And it's not sweat or dirt, exactly. Americans are very good about keeping the body clean. The soul is another story. But the smell of bodies packed in with you, and so many of them, of course, in different stages of undress, because that's how you do it today. Think of cattle car more than of the friendly sky. Well, after such a trip a couple of years ago, one summer, getting back, I mentioned to Father Chicada, I said, I felt like St. Christina the Astonishing. And he gave me one of those looks, so much as if to say, now what are you talking about? And my response, well, doesn't everybody know who St. Christina the Astonishing is? But he didn't know, and I didn't know either. You know how we have the All Saints Sunday and the, and the mothers do the children in the costumes, and at some point in our history at St. Gertrude, it became a sort of a stump the bishop, and some enterprising home education mothers would come up with very exotic saints, and then I wouldn't know who they were. And um, then they had to finally tell me who it was. Well, that happened to me once with St. Christina the Astonishing, July 24th, and I read all about it, and I was very happy to be introduced to her. Saints are always interesting, but she is particularly so. Uh, she lived, um, well, she was born in 1150. She lived in Belgium. She uh, had three, there, is, there were three of them in the family. She was the youngest, and she died very, rather young, I think maybe in her teens or early 20s, and came back to life during the Agnus Dei, of her Requiem Mass. And during that time, she visited hell. And she saw a lot of people she knew there in hell. That got me thinking, has anyone ever noticed how unusual is our golden arrow prayer? And actually, what you come across very often is, in effect, someone sort of translated it in a different sense, that our Lord told Sister Mary St. Pierre that the most holy, most sacred, most adorable, most incomprehensible and ineffable name of God he forever praised, blessed, loved, adored, and glorified in heaven, on earth, and in hell. Not under the earth, but actually it is in hell, I think. And another version says, and in the hells, meaning hell being everything in the afterlife that's not heaven, so that would include purgatory, limbo, as well as hell itself. And then the prayer is the same at the end. By all the creatures of God, and by the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the most holy sacrament of the altar. Well, she went to hell, and then she went to purgatory, and there were indeed a good amount of her acquaintances there. And then she went to heaven, and she was offered the choice to stay there or return to earth and liberate the poor souls by her prayer and by her penance. So she chose to come back. And all of this happened, because eternity is not time, all of this happened 
during the three Agnus days that were sung at her Requiem Mass. And when she came back to life, she sat up and she soared to one of the beams in the church and she perched herself there. Well, everybody fled, with the exception of her one sister. She stayed put, and the priest, of course, the priest at the altar because he was offering the mass. After mass, the priest came out and made her come down, and she told the story. She said she fled to the roof of the church because she couldn't bear the smell of people, sinful human beings. Well, for years, she went on doing astonishing things. That's how she got her name. She would flee into remote places. She was known for crawling into ovens and plunging herself into icy rivers just to escape not just people. You may feel like that some days. But I mean the smell of human beings. Angels are particularly sensitive to that too, I believe. And she would curl up into a ball like a cat, or else she would caw like a bird. And she faced fire more than once with impunity. And most people thought she was crazy. Others thought she must be possessed by the devil. And they tried to capture her without success. But saints and sinners, the two extremes, they knew better. They venerated her. They told her their sins. And St. Lutgard, who was a great Cistercian mystic of that era, St. Lutgard asked for her advice. She's not the only saint, of course, who could smell sin and who suffered from its stench. St. Joseph Cupertino, who's another one of the flying saints, maybe those two qualities go together, he could smell sin on people. So could St. Catherine of Siena, but she couldn't fly. The flesh, St. Paul talks to it, us about that today, doesn't he, in the epistle. He wants to persuade us that the flesh has no claim over us anymore. We don't have to follow it. You really don't. You don't have to live according to it. Now, to live according to the flesh is more than to violate one or two of the commandments, say, sins of the flesh, sixth and the ninth. Or even if you throw in the fifth with gluttony and, and drunkenness. No, to live a life according to the flesh is to follow fallen human nature in your outlook on things. You can slip into that in one department or another without even thinking about it too much influenced as we all are by our ignorance and our human prejudices and dedicated as we all are to our paltry human ambitions. Think of the unjust steward in the gospel today. One preacher referred to him as the crafty manager. He thought he would get everything figured out by cheating his employer to feather his nest and he would be all right. He's a good example of prudence of the flesh. You could actually obey some of the commandments, say you could practice holy purity and still be pretty fleshly in your life and outlook by pride or envy of others, or jealousy, greed, despising your neighbor, a kind of a, generally speaking, a, a worldly, to have a worldly spirit about yourself. And that's something that a lot of people catch. You can kind of scent that, smell that a little bit. If you live, though, according to the flesh, you shall die. But if by the spirit you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. The spirit in today's epistle, what does that mean? It has three meanings. First, God the Holy Ghost, third person of the Trinity. Second, our spirit, our soul, which makes us to live. Third, some particular, well, they call it a disposition of spirit. That is to say, 
your orientation, your thoughts about things. A good one is due to the Holy Ghost dwelling within you because the Spirit is a way of doing things or thinking about things. So you could say, the Spirit of Padre Pio was summed up in three words, pray, hope, and don't worry. And a friend of his, another Italian priest, the same era, Don Dolindo from uh, Naples, he used to tell people, give it to Jesus, but really give it to him. Give him everything. And do not worry. Padre Pio knew sins without smelling them on people. The people could smell him, that odor of sanctity, a delicious perfume that would be very hard to describe. And when St. Therese comes around to answer a prayer, sometimes you smell roses, which is a beautiful thing. The spirit of love. Our blessed Savior is love incarnate. He doesn't transform our love into something purely spiritual. The flesh is always involved. Why is that? Because of the doctrine of the incarnation. Our Lord became a man to redeem us, to buy us back, flesh and spirit, by his passion. Buy us back from whom? From the devil, from death, from sin. He makes us to be, by grace, innocent, again, just the way man was before lust entered into the heart in the garden. This is the spirit of our Lord, the God the Holy Ghost, which our blessed Savior sends to us. That's why he takes the flesh and he reorders it and heals it and makes it to be holy. The only way that we can prove what we feel in our heart or, or think in our head is by means of that which is external. The way you prove your love for God is shown all week long, isn't it? For those of you, for example, who are in the married state following your vocation, that's a matter not only of the spirit, but also of the flesh to cooperate with Almighty God and bringing new life into the world. How awesome. People, though, are always getting that mixed up, one way or another. Flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. We do not the things that we would. St. Dominic, today's saint, he faced that because there was this terrible anti-life heresy, you know, about going all over the place, and they believed that anything physical was created by a devil god and that the real god only made the spiritual... So it didn't much matter which, what you did in the flesh. You see notes of Protestantism here because you can't really help yourself anyway. And, Saint Do- and, and there wasn't much preaching going on in those days. And sometimes the example of the higher clergy wasn't as edifying as it should be. And these heretics had people they called the perfect ones and they did astounding deeds of penance and the simple people were taken in by that, and they liked the idea that they personally would not have to keep the Ten Commandments anymore if they joined up. St. Dominic started preaching. He got a few followers with him, and he felt he wasn't very successful at all, although he was an excellent preacher. And so he, he prayed. And we went away in southern France and Provence to a forest, prayed for three days and nights, He scourged himself, did deeds of penance, fasted, of course. And our blessed lady came to him, and she told him, and she gave him the rosary. She said, when God desired to renew the face of the earth, that's the Holy Ghost prayer that's done by the Holy Ghost, by means of the incarnation, everything started with the Hail Mary, Dominic. The Hail Mary. If you want to know success, Preach my, my Psalter, my 150 prayers, which is, of course, the rosary. He did. The rosary 
like Catholic worship, employs the five senses, touch, speech, and indeed memory and uh, imagination as well. And he was successful. And if you want a new spirit, if you want to leave aside the works of the flesh this summer, and if you want to be able to deal with how much you owe the master, but in an honest way, well, use the rosary. It takes you back to the beginning and to innocence again. What happened to St. Christina? Oh, well, at some point she sat in a baptismal font, and that did her a lot of good. It calmed her down, and she didn't mind the smell of people so much anymore, and she finished her days in a convent. Baptismal font, baptism, taking away our sins, to begin again by means of a mystical rebirth. That's confession for us today, and that is, at the same time, a worthy Holy Communion. And in between, and every day, when the flesh claims its own and wants you to pay up, you've got your rosary. Don't live according to the flesh. You don't have to. Not anymore. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.